So before we get started and read our, our passage for today, our text, I wanted to ask a, a question going into this time that's, that's related to what we're going to get into. And it's number one, actually, on, our, on the little fill in the blank. Who do you have the most respect for on this earth? Who's the person that you have the most respect for? You can write it down, or if anybody would like to say who it is, feel free to. I most respect for Jerry. Jerry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. He's quite a person. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. You know him better than all of us, yeah. but. For 50 years. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you respect Jerry most for, would you say? Well, uh, he stays in the Bible. Uh, he taught here for Sunday school for years, mm. and he started studying on Sunday night for the next. And uh, he's always, and there's a place at our house where he he has his devotions. Mm -hmm. Just a really great example, not just to me, but to our children. Mm. Godly leader. Sometimes men of God like that are hard to come by, but it's, it's always encouraging when you know one, especially as you do <laughs> intimately. That's fantastic. Thank you, Francis, for sharing that. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's a great example. Wonderful. Yeah, who do you have the most respect for on this earth? Uh, maybe the... America might not be so much of like an honor society as some of the different cultures are, maybe towards um, in the Middle East or even in, I guess, some parts of Europe. So we might miss some of that language, but there are certainly still people that we, you know, hold in high esteem and have a great deal of respect for. You know, we know obviously that everyone that we do have a, a lot of respect for is, are still humans, <laughs> and so they're, they're fallible people. But... There are some really good examples out there for us to look to. And so that's something to keep in mind here as we, as we uh, move on. But we'll, we'll come back to that and talk about that theme a little bit more. So we're going to be through, I hope I put it on the fill in the blank. But we're going to go from 432, it's chapter 4, verses 32 of Acts, all the way, I think. If we don't get there, that's fine. Estimated to verse 16 of chapter 5. <clears throat> so, would anybody be willing to read? No, well, it's kind of a lot. Well, it's like, how many verses is that? 20 um, something verses. Is it anybody be willing to read that, that section? I'll read it. Don? Thank you. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. <clears throat> with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. 
Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. The young men, then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in, in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at, last, at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Mm. Thank you, Don. All right, so going back to chapter 4, starting in verse 32 there, there's that little section right before chapter 5. Does this passage remind you of anything that we've already read in the book of Acts? Didn't they talk about this back in chapter 2? Yep, sure enough. Yeah. So after the new converts received the Holy Spirit, we saw some of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and very similarly stated in chapter 2, they were selling their possessions and goods, and they gave to anyone as he had need, and they, they continued to meet together. So it's a... Uh, it's kind of stating this again, just the, how the continuing of the fruits of the Spirit were acting in this way. It's a powerful thing, but this passage is not isolated. It's, it's moving into chapter 5, and it's very connected with chapter 5. So we don't want, or with, well, with the first 11 verses of chapter 5. So we don't really want to divorce that them from each other by any means. That's one thing with, with uh, good hermeneutics, I know we keep talking about this, but sometimes, you know, if you have a daily reading and you read, you're like, well, I'll read a chapter a day, and then you read your chapter, and then you notice the next, the start of the next chapter starts with and, or but, or therefore, it's like, well, <laughs> maybe I should keep rolling for a little bit, because it seems like there's some point of contact here, there's some connection. I don't want to miss the context of the story that I'm reading. <laughs> and that's the case here. Although the NIV, it says now, but I think uh, according to what I read in some of the commentaries, that now is a pretty emphatic word in Greek, so it's, it's <laughs> inciting that they're very, very connected together. So this, is, this little section here, I mean, it's amazing what they're doing uh, with great... Uh, all the believers were one, one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything that they had. Uh, with, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Much grace was on them all, so they were trying to continue emphasizing that by, by miraculous things happening, that, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And then 34, there were no needy persons among them. From, for from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. So this is this is an amazing thing. Uh, it, it really does show how selfless these these new believers were acting, and the, the genuine love and affection they, that they had for one another. And this is honestly something that I think is an incredible. I know I don't want to. You know, hone in on this too much, but it is a really great example for us believers who are here today. I think I said this several weeks ago, but I think that this this particular congregation does do a good job of trying to check in on one another and, and care for one another's needs, and I really do appreciate that. But it does remind us for maybe those of us who struggle with with selfishness, which <laughs> don't be offended, but I probably say that's all of us to some degree. Right? because it manifests itself in different forms. I know it's certainly true of myself. Um, <laughs> look, look not only to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Is, that's a difficult teaching. But this is an amazing thing. That's the number two there in the fill in the blanks. This selflessness, 
first pulling pair. This the selflessness displayed by the new believers is a powerful witness to the church today. Selflessness to the church. Great example to the church. Wonderful. And then we see this figure Barnabas popping up, right? So Joseph, verse 36, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Wow. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really... <laughs> That's a, that's a pretty amazing thing. <laughs> I don't know why I got it in my head. I just thought of like buying a plot of land in 2022 here in Morristown. You can buy an acre for like $300,000 essentially. It's, it's pretty ridiculous right now, but I just think that. You know, it's like here, you know, I have this plot of land that I'd like to give you. But I mean, that was, a, that was an incredibly generous gesture even in that time period. So a wonderful, wonderfully, uh, visible change of heart that has happened in these people since they have come to know Jesus. So Barnabas, his story, that, that small little snippet, well, you know, well, obviously, if you've ever read, Act, ever read Acts, you'll know that his name pops up a few more times, and so that's something to keep in mind. But Luke, but Luke uh, introduces him in this way. What a way to be introduced into a story. It's like, and and so-and-so, did, and Mike you know, did this incredible thing, and everyone's like, okay, hold on, who's this Mike guy? You know, what's going on? It's going to happen later on. It's a, it's a really good setup. But his story, what he did, is directly contrasted to <laughs> what we're about to read <laughs> in a pretty brutal way. <clears throat> I forget where I was supposed to read that, but... Um, <clears throat> But his, it's contrasted. We see his selfless, selflessness versus the selfishness of Ananias and Sapphira. So let's move on to chapter 5 here. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. So starting off good. It's like, okay, are they going to do the same thing? With his wife's full knowledge... <laughs> He kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. So in this first verse here, we see some intel about what was going on here, some of the motivations. And did, did Luke portray this as an accident? Is it it's like, well, oops, didn't mean to. Yeah, no. No, this was a deliberate, premeditated sin that they, in, in conjunction with one another, agreed to lie to the church and, and uh, keep back a portion of the profits for, from the, the land that they sold for themselves. <laughs> oh man, they, uh, they are about to pay for this. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's verse 2. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. So this is actually, I, I keep getting, I got ahead again. Here we go. Already started. Number three on the fill in the blanks. I already said this. You can probably guess what it is. The story of Ananias and Sapphira is contrasted to what was just said. What was 2A? Oh, right. <laughs> Even though separated by chapter divisions, this story is entirely connected. Wednesday nights and I'll still do that. 
Yeah, so the story of Ananias and Sapphira is contrasted to what was just said. That's number three, and then 3A, it's what we just said. This couple agreed to lie about their offering. Mm. Yeah. So, going down to verse 3, and Peter said, Ananias, how very perceptive he is, uh, the Apostle Peter is, is speaking to this man. Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? So, what was 3A? 3A is this couple agreed to lie about their offering. That'd be good. So the emphasis all throughout the book of Acts so far, I mean, it's been heavily, heavily focused on the Holy Spirit, right? And um, the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus said, he had promised, came and fell on the apostles in very miraculous ways, and then fell on the people of God, these new converts, in um, more subtle ways of bearing fruit in some of the fruits of the Spirit that we later see in Galatians. But the emphasis is still on the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So, what Peter says here in verse 3 to Ananias is also contrasted to what has been happening in so many of the, the believers' lives. He's, you know, all these people are supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, um, experiencing this generosity. And Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit who is supposed to be the one indwelling him, and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land. So this was a this was a big deal. It's a big accusation, and <laughs> we'll see it later on. It causes a it causes a big stir in the in the church, but for good reason. This is this is a, a, a big calling out of a, a, a egregious sin. So. One thing, right here it says, who did, who did they lie to? Who is the first person that, that uh, Peter says that they have lied to? <laughs> the Holy Spirit, right. Okay, so it says they have lied to the Holy Spirit. Now, hold that for just a minute. Um, that's the first part of 3B. Let's, let's go to verse 4 for just a second here. So didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? So I think J.R. has said this multiple times from the pulpit, but or at least he, I know he's talked about this story at least one time. But these, this, this couple, I mean, they were not necessarily under an obligation to give uh, this, this full amount. But... That wasn't, that wasn't necessarily the issue. It was the fact that they had lied about what they were giving. If they had gone to Peter beforehand and said, look, we sold this plot of land. Uh, turns out we, we need some of the money. Like we're maybe, maybe, I don't know, for whatever reason they had hard times. I mean, this is all just hypothesizing. But saying like, we need some of this and we, I'm sorry, we can't give what we had previously committed to. And so that, if they had been honest in that way, you know, maybe this story would have gone completely different from what we see here. But it was a matter of the heart, uh, the inclination towards evil, that they would lie so freely without really any conviction. You know, if you, if you meditate on something beforehand, there's no kind of internal conflict there to, to repent of that. You know, if this was, I don't, we don't know how to time frame here, but maybe this was a week, a month beforehand, and they had just agreed to do this sin, and uh, no, no kind of change of heart or anything like that. We don't, none of the text indicates that because they carried it through, as we see here. It reminds me that sometimes, you know, when we sin as Christians, um, we're obviously at varying levels of, of sanctification, but... When we sin, oftentimes, I know it is like a spur, like 
an in the moment thing. Maybe it's a, a burst of anger where you intentionally desire to hurt somebody, um, as apart from righteous anger, of course, which is a good thing. But or uh, you know maybe we we lie to someone just in the heat of a moment or something like that, and then so for some of us it's immediate where we're like, oh, I should not have done that. Like it, it, you, you immediately you feel that oh gosh, like, what have I done? I I've I've committed the sin against this person and against God. I, I need to go and ask for, to ask for forgiveness. Or maybe like we, we commit a sin and then a day later we're like we're. we're meditating on um, well, like the, the events of recent and we're like, oh man, I have done this thing. And I, you didn't maybe just didn't think about it before, but now you're like, oh gosh, I'm, the Holy Spirit convicts you and uh, you go and, and make amends with that person. But here we don't really see any kind of heart change with these people. Premeditated and they're in it. They're in it to win it. Although <laughs> they're in it to lose it. Lose their life. So yeah, so verse 4. So that's kind of where we're at. And then, at the end of verse 4, so, he said he lied to the Holy Spirit, right? Very interesting. And then, at the end of verse 4, he said, you have not lied to men, but to God. So, what's the connection here? The Holy Spirit is God. Yeah. This is one of the, I would say, probably most powerful places in Scripture that seems pretty explicitly make this connection. And so, oftentimes, you know, there are different religions. I mean, like, I think of uh, Jehovah's Witness, for one, that say the, the Holy Spirit is... I forget exactly how they define that, but it, the Holy Spirit is not God for them. It's this some kind of entity that is related to God in some way, but not, not the same thing. Of course, they wouldn't say that Jesus is God either. They would say that Jesus is uh, Michael, the, the archangel. But places like this in Scripture kind of kind of put a roadblock there for, for that kind of thinking and that kind of theology. And Peter, for him, it seems to be a pretty one-to-one -one connection that the Holy Spirit is God. So that's something when we're when we it's a small note. If we come across places like that, maybe maybe some conversations with people who might want to fight us on that front, then we can point them to Acts 5 and say, look. Hey, in Scripture, this is kind of what's laid out here. This is one of those places where we can do that. But, on, well, okay, <laughs> holster that for a second. 3B, they lied to the Holy Spirit, who is God. Rachel, do you already have that one filled out? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's what happens. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> yeah, they lied to the Holy Spirit, who is God. Uh, that's no laughing matter. So even if even if Ananias and Sapphira thought they were just lying to people and you know kind of leaving God of the equation, they're just saying, well, we'll just kind of. Get the glory of selling our full, the full profit, or giving the full profits of what we just made to the church, uh, without actually having some of that. For maybe, maybe for them it wasn't so big of a deal. But Peter makes the immediate remark that it, it is indeed a huge deal. Um, that the the lesser sin for him is that they lied to people. The the greater sin is that they lied to God Almighty, and that is a serious matter. I think that's kind of funny because how do you lie to the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit is in you? It's yeah. not like you're doing this in the dark or something, yeah. you know, where you're... Yeah. Right. It makes you quite... Yeah, it really makes you think about, like, where their state was, you know? I don't know. I guess we don't really see any information here in the text about how they stood before God. Yeah, it's yeah. Obviously, in the text, like you're saying, Dar, that's very, it's very confusing because like something like that from a Christian who has the Holy Spirit in them is that's not common behavior. Or at least it shouldn't be. <laughs> being so okay with with lying to God and being unrepentant in doing so. Um. Okay. 
we'll, we'll keep reading and then we'll we'll circle back and look at all of this in, in the big picture and talk about a little bit about what's going on here. So verse 5, when Ananias heard this, this accusation from Peter, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. <laughs> then the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Giving her a chance to confess here. She says, Yes, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who bury your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So Luke emphasizes here the impact that this had on the, the Christian community, which was a big one. The, the fear of God, it, it ripped the church, and that is uh, 3C, actually, there, the film blanks. The fear of God ripped the church. Before, I think before, uh, I kind of want to give my own, well, my own, People have influenced that idea, view of what's been going on in this passage and some of the emphasis here. I wanted to kind of gauge the room, see what you guys thought about this. I mean, this is this is a little bit of a tough text because for some of us, we're like, well, I've lied before. You know, I've I have been untruthful in some ways, and sometimes maybe it has been, you know, premeditated, premeditated, where you're just had agreed with yourself to, to lie to somebody about something. How are you all doing with this passage? Do you, do you find it difficult? Or any things in here that you want to point out you're, you're struggling with or that you want to emphasize? I think it's interesting that some people say that so this is like communism in the Bible. This is the first communism here, but <laughs> like, like, no, I don't think so. I think that uh, falls pretty short. But, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's a time, I guess, the church is really, I mean, they're, they're fleeing persecution. And, yeah. they're, and they're pulling their resources. <clears throat> and it's very important and that they're trusting God, most of all. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, um, you know, maybe it's a precursor to what's going to happen in the future to the church. You know, mm -hmm. We'll have to, like, come together and you know, well, we can't be lying to the Holy yeah. Spirit, we can't be lying to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It seems extreme, though, I mean, because it was their money. I mean, that their sin really was saying, oh, look at us, we're, we're giving you all the money, but they kept some back. Mm. I mean, that just seems very extreme. The results that yeah. what happened to them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a very natural reaction that a lot of Christians, I mean, myself included, have had in reading this passage sometimes. Yeah. yeah it's an extreme. Well, we'll talk about that actually in a second. But yeah, I mean, I think that's. I just kind of wonder if they were taken out because God knew that when the chips really fell down, they were not going to be able to withstand. I mean, Yes, it was their money. If they wanted to give it, they could. Mm -hmm. You know, they they was really kind of stupid. I mean, if they didn't want to give it, they didn't have to. No one was forcing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, Gracie emphasizing the sovereignty of God and you know Him knowing their their hearts perfectly, where we can not necessarily look into that. Yeah, that's that is certainly true. I think it's kind of interesting where the. Uh, <coughs> Everyone then is afraid to join the church because hmm. look what happened when they didn't live up to what they said they were doing, mm -hmm. and yeah. and and we 
the church now, you know, we, we want to make it sound like this is going to be a good thing for you, but, and, and no, life isn't always going to be easy, but we don't usually expect this to happen. <laughs> um, but, that, but on a different scale, perhaps, it's, it's kind of a weeding out. It's like mm. if you don't really are you all believe in? it. Yeah, are you all in? If all you don't in. really trust and believe enough to be for, this, for God, Mm -hmm. then you're not really helping, so mm -hmm. let's just prune the bush. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Nowhere were any of these people commanded to sell anything they sold. They were doing it out of love for one another. Yeah. And I think, and as the story goes, it looks like uh, they weren't, as Don said, they weren't all in. Uh, they wanted to be recognized for giving something, but yeah. they didn't want to give it all. But they didn't have to give it all. They didn't have to give in. Right. They acted like they did. Right. Yeah. Yep. That's great insight. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, it's certainly an example for the church is maybe one of the ways that I to take that as well, that they are not all in like you're saying, and it, there's some Old Testament examples, um, oh goodness, I can't remember his name, um, but in Joshua 7, um, the fellow who took the gold out of the temple, I think it was out of the temple, and then uh, they'd have an Abihu. So there's a few there's a few Old Testament examples that are obviously not specific circumstances of this, but close enough to where <clears throat> there it shows that sometimes there are examples like this in Scripture to show to make a point uh, and, and and show something. And what Luke is really doing here. As he's, as he's been doing in all the first few chapters of Acts, is we're going to go forward and then we'll bounce back. So this is 3E. The, this story, it emphasizes, once again, the power of the Holy Spirit. So power is that first blank. So yeah, sorry, Grace, I'm making it tough on you. You're going to have to bump, jump to E. Okay. Or make notes and jump to E and then go back down to D. Or you can do the other way around if you want to. Oh, yeah. So this story emphasizes, once again, the power of the Holy Spirit working through the apostles. So that's what he's been doing this whole time. He's showing consistently, time and time again, how the Holy Spirit is the one who is working powerfully through the apostles and how they have this authority from God in enacting itself in these miraculous ways. But what is the, the example here? One of the main things that's emphasized is the holiness of God. Sometimes, I think that in especially some, some church culture today, I've seen this a lot, maybe not so much in this, this particular congregation, but in some others where people, I mean even sermons, well-meaning well sermons that talk about the Lord's Prayer, for example, and how Jesus said, you know, Abba, Father, and people try to relate that to say, well, you know, God is just our, our dad, and he loves us in this, in this really sweet way, and he's just so close to us um, in, in that, like, humanly father figure-esque way. And it, it, it kind of, it does, that, that view does a good job of, of communicating God's love for us, which is obviously incredibly very true. But what's something that it's weak in is that it doesn't communicate well the holiness of God and the transcendence of God. Understanding that God is not like us in any way. We are like Him. We are created in His image. Um, in, well, I said we are like Him very, <laughs> very faint ways. We, we are able to, um, to act in, in some of the ways that... that he does uh, in very small uh, ways. But 
but he is not like us. He is not, the creator is not like the creator. <coughs> so God is transcendent. He is holy. He is set apart. And, you know, understanding this, especially all throughout the Old Testament, that is communicated heavily just how holy God is and how worthy he is of praise and, and honor and allegiance. And so this is a text that points that out, points this truth out once again to this early church, that God is not just like their, their, their buddy who they're walking along life with, um, and they kind of like punch each other on the shoulder every now and then as they're walking down the beach or something like that, that, that God, is, God is holy, holy, holy. He is majestic and, and is worthy of more adjectives than I know in, in the English language and, and so much more. And so this, this story communicates as well that these people, they have made it up in their minds to, to lie to come and try to deceive a holy God, try to manipulate him in some way, try to earn some favor that was only born out of deception. And so this is, a, this is an incredible sin, and, and from the result of this sin, which is the, the death of this couple, of Ananias and Sapphira, the, correctly so, the fear of God falls upon the church in a powerful way. Fear for Christians is is very different from the fear of an unbeliever. Fear of an unbelief, fear of an unbeliever fears God in a way of God will destroy me. The fear of the Christian uh, viewing God is is the correct way of God is holy. He is worthy of my 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 utmost and so much more. Understanding that He is majestic and transcendent in nature, and uh, but there's confidence in that too. It's not the fear of punishment. Because Romans 1 tells us there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So there has to be those, those, that distinction made there as well. Um, I guess I'll tack, tack on just along with that. Um, we, we do know that God loves us. Like He is a holy God and He, he is for us and He has sent His Son Jesus Christ to die for us. And, in, in the most profound and um, amazing love that, that this world has ever seen. And that's something that we obviously hold on to as Christians. We, we hold on to as believers. It's, it's the very thing that draws us to him in the first place. And so we, we accept that and we rejoice in it. But we, you know, it's both, yeah. It's like a, it's a, yes, a yes and amen kind of thing where we see God's love and his holiness combined. And, and uh, we, we respond in the appropriate way. But... That's, that's one of the things that I think is being effectively communicated here, that, that God is holy. And, and uh, like this text says, um, verse 11, great fear sees the whole church and all who heard about these events. So they know that this is a big deal. And once again, this, this communicates the truth that Jesus Christ has indeed risen from the dead because there's, there's powerful things being played out by the work of the Holy Spirit just as Jesus promised would come to these believers. So, all of this is going on for a very intentional purpose. Wasn't it in the uh, Chronicles of Narnia where someone asked of Aslan if he's safe? And he was answered, no, he's not safe, but he's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I kind of think about that from time to time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Cuddling up to Jesus, but it's like you know, he's a lion. Yeah. You know. Yeah. At the same time, he's very powerful. Yeah. Very, very, very holy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Jews wouldn't say his name. You know, they would use the tetragrammaton instead to mark the name of God. Um. Along with that, I mean, going back to the. The, uh, the the Lord's Prayer that that term the I didn't really connect that well but Abba Abba Father I mean that's well Abba would have been a song, would have been in the Greek a, a term of um, deep respect um, parental respect and honor and so it's it's um, it's 
probably misused in a lot of the ways that some people use it today. I get their intentions with it, but it really does communicate a lot of respect and honor from the, the one saying it. So that's something to keep in mind. But that was what we were talking about, like who do we have the most respect for on this earth? Um, maybe you have, like for me, you know, there's some people who I have respect for that I, I just, like I can't call them by their first name. It's just there's just too much respect there. Like even if they even if they allow it to be so, you know, I, want, I would only call them Mr. or Mrs. Such and such, just out of respect for them. And it's just a place of honor that they have in my life. And so, you know, viewing God as we have that intimacy with Him that He has allowed allowed us to have, and at the same time we <laughs> we we understand that He is who He is and, and deserves our respect. And he's perfect. Hmm. Oh yeah, that was really some really good insight. I appreciate your comments on this passage. That you guys have said some things that I hadn't really thought about before. So that was that was really good. We got we got a few minutes. I think we're going to finish the last uh, few verses here, twelve through sixteen. This one is essentially just another summary of uh, what's been going on. Oh, sorry, 3D. God is holy. Got it. <laughs> I only said it. I only said it probably 14 times. So I don't know how. What was three? Three. Just the the title one. The, the story of Ananias, yes. that one. So the story of Ananias and Sapphira is contrasted okay. to what was just said in the last part of it, chapter 4. <laughs> yeah, 3D, God is holy. <laughs> mm, all right, 12. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, <laughs> well, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the, into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. So, quick note there, verse 12, the apostles were still the ones performing these miraculous signs. The text doesn't really give any indication to that. Some of the lay people were also having these miraculous con continual gifts of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's another note there. Um, so the believers continue to meet together, and then there's a little, 13 is kind of a weird one, right? It's what you are talking about, Don, just a, a few minutes ago. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. And it seems like contradicting, because in verse 14, it's like, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and ran into their number. So it's like, what's going on here? I thought this little excerpt from one of the commentaries was, was helpful. <coughs> uh, this is by F.F. F. Bruce. It says, One may wonder how the statement that none of the others dared to join the disciples can be squared with the report of more and more being added to their fellowship. The point seems to be that the death of Ananias and Sapphira scared off all but the totally committed. So, right, like you guys are talking about, all in. Again, we are told of the signs and wonders performed through the agency of the apostles. The general atmosphere is like that of the earlier days of our Lord's uh, Galilean ministry. And then it goes on. It, it talks about how, well, let me just read it. Peter's shadow, so down in uh, verse 15. Peter's shadow was as, oh my gosh, efficacious. That's a word, right? 
Peter's shadow was as efficacious as a medium of healing power as the fringe of his master's cloak had been. Uh, although, I don't know, that statement from him, I'm like, eh. It doesn't necessarily say that the people were actually healed from his shadow, but they... they oh. Right. So the shadow of a person was thought to be kind of the extension of that person in this time period, so that's like what that little detail was about. It was just thought to be kind of the extension of that, uh, that individual. So no wonder that the common people uh, sounded the apostles' praises and that the number of believers increased. Even from outlying towns and villages of Judea, people streamed into the capital city with their sick folk in hope of profiting from the apostles' healing ministry. Uh, Peter's reputation evidently stood spe specially high in this regard. So... One last little note here, and then you guys can give me some feedback from this passage that we've read tonight. That 16 crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, or their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. So, well, number four first. Acts 5, 12 through 16, once again shows how the early church is growing. So Acts, Acts 5, 12 through 16, once again shows how the early church is growing. And then we see really two types of healing here. So maybe only physical healing up to this point, but what else is here? Yeah. Yeah, so the apostles, through the power of the Holy Spirit in them, have the authority over the body, right? And then they also have authority over the spirit, the soul of the person. So they are over in dark spirit, spiritual forces. So that's, that's a big note here. I think that's the first time maybe we see that in Acts. So that's 4A. Healings were both physical and spiritual. Once again, testifying to God's power, Jesus Christ's power over the body and the soul. Testifying to his resurrection from the dead. Okay. What are your thoughts on this passage here? We got <laughs> one minute. <laughs> Any last notes? Maybe that they they didn't want to join the number of the apostles and disciples, but yet they were willing to to join you know, not to join them, but to gain the church and accept their healing power. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, a part of, I guess I read verse 12 there when it said, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join, dared join them. So part of me thinks that it's the them is the believers who is mentioned in verse 12. Uh, even though they, the, maybe the believers there, were highly regarded by the people. So maybe that's, maybe that's what we're talking about there. Sometimes I have to go back and just like read the mm -hmm. read the passage before just to see like you know if there's anything in there that could give me some hints. But yeah, it's yeah. it's a good thought. Well, I thought that they and the twelve meant the apostles. Oh. Like you're saying it's all believers. Well, I mean, just in verse twelve, the the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the and then and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join, dared join them. So I would think that the most recent group mentioned would have been the believers. That was the last group mentioned in verse 12. But I don't know. Maybe it was the apostles. Yeah, but I mean, it just shows that there was some apprehension about this whole... Yeah, the point of it is just to show, like, 
whoa, something big is going on here. Do I actually want to be a part of this or not? Uh, showing it's not like a high school club. <laughs> there's some there's some real commitment here. I can kind of see where she's feel like mine says many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. And then could have confirmed the apostles were together. Right. And I can see both sides of that. How you can interpret yeah. That. What what uh Well the people can't really join the apostles anyway. They can yeah, the apostles are they can become a disciple but they can't join the well, apostles that's what I meant. anymore. Become like a leader, a disciple, not an apostle, but to join them. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's good to ask questions like that, though. I mean, yeah, it's always good to ask questions like if there's something that jumps out to you, for sure. All right. Any other final final word there? Okie dokie. Thank you guys for your attention this evening. And let me, uh, well, I want to pray. Does anybody want to pray to close tonight? <laughs> Usually that's a question of the silence. <laughs> Jerry, after all the wonderful things we heard about him. Tonight. Jerry Francis was just talking you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that was. <laughs> maybe I need to get in here earlier. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, Jerry, would you mind closing us in prayer? Well, we're so thankful for this time of study. It's just good to get into your word, and we know that we continue to find the new revelation each time that we look at it. The early church was. So, such an example of what Christianity is, that they just gave of themselves completely. They had the inspiration of the apostles there with them, but they took hold of it and ran with it and carried out your will. I'm thankful for them. Thank you for Ross and his time of study and leadership as well. Go with us now to our homes and keep us in your care. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.